Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation, which will focus on the highly anticipated report recently published by NASM on the state of organ donation and transplantation in the United States. Today's session is brought to you by the Alliance in partnership with NATCO and the American Society of Transplantation. My name is Deanna Fenton, and I serve as a Senior Manager of Educational Program Development here at the Alliance, and it's my pleasure to serve as the host for today's session. Now, as always, we'd like to encourage you all to use this as an opportunity to engage with your colleagues and offer your insights or even post questions. So before we begin, please take this opportunity to locate the chat feature, which is located in the Zoom navigation bar at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, for those of you who may be joining us today as a group, I'd like to ask that you take this opportunity to complete the following poll to indicate approximately how many people have joined your group. Now, as an added opportunity for engagement, we'll be utilizing the Mentimeter tool towards the end of the program to request your feedback on specific questions regarding the NASM report. In preparation for that segment, we'd like to ask that you get connected to the platform. So to do so, please navigate to menti.com and you can do so by opening up a separate browser or tab. And when prompted, enter the code listed on this slide. For those of you who may not be able to see it, that code is 38058229. Just for future reference, we'll also pop that code in the chat and also the direct link to the platform so that you can reference that later today. If you happen to have the Mentimeter app, you can also um, access this discussion using the same code. Now, without further delay, I'd like to begin the program by turning the floor over to our moderator, Jan Finn, who serves as a president and CEO of Midwest Transplant Network. Thank you so much, Deanna. I'm really happy to be here today. It's such an honor to be part of this. You know, I think that oftentimes there are defining moments in our careers. And I would say for many of us, the HRSA Breakthrough Collaborative on Organ Donation was one of those moments. It really taught us so much. We learned from our, our great panelists today, Dennis Wagner and other colleagues. And I, I believe that the NASM report is going to offer an incredible opportunity for some of that same energy. We really developed during that period of time and were able to make great changes, improvements that saved lives. And one of the things that I'm most excited, I think today, is to know that we're going to hear from some people that I think you'll find a real treat. The first speaker is Dennis Wagner. Known to many of us, he is an enthusiastic, thoughtful and strategic leader, and he's really committed in delivering on bold goals and taught us all to be able to do that, both in our homes, uh, our work life, and, and everything that I think he does, he really empowers and energizes others. And he wants to help people and provide value in all of the work that he's done. He's nationally and internationally recognized leader. That um, really is, quite modest when you think about it, because he's the expert in quality improvement, hospital safety. We know about organ donation and transplantation and making those improvements, social marketing in the environment. Dennis and his teams have led uh, many different areas in the public and private sector in those communities to achieve unprecedented improvements. That really says a lot. These results have increased access to higher quality health care, for the underserved and vulnerable people, dramatic and lasting national increases in life-saving and life-enhancing transplantation. And that really touches each of us. A cleaner indoor air and improved health for millions of the poorest people on the planet by just changing their cook stoves. Dennis and two fellow senior leaders at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services were recognized as Federal Employee of the Year in 2016 for their participation in public service. Their work in safety, many of you may not be aware of, but in the US hospitals, this particular work resulted in 1.2 million fewer harms to patients, almost $20 billion in savings, and 87,000 lives saved. Those particular numbers I think are staggering. And when we think about the impact for organ donation and transplantation, I know it, it really speaks to each of us. He's joined by Dr. Ken Kaiser, a medical director, doctor, and has a master's in public health. He's internationally respected as a physician executive whose diverse professional experience includes senior leadership positions in state and federal government, the private sector, academia, and philanthropy. He has a rare distinction of being elected to both the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Public Administration. He not only led and transformed the Veterans Administration and the Clinton Administration, 
But one of the things that I'm really excited to know more about, he was the founding president and CEO of the National Quality Forum. He currently serves as a senior executive advisor to the Aegis Group in Washington, D.C., and is an adjunct professor in Stanford School of Medicine. He sits on several boards, several healthcare companies, and he's one of the longest serving California state health directors. So please help me welcome these esteemed panelists and let us hear about the NASM report and how it can affect us and will change us both in equity and increasing transplantation. Thank you. Oh, I forgot I have another slide, excuse me. So one of the things we are planning to do today is to get you thinking, you know, when we were in the collaborative era, one of the things we love is questions to run on. My organization still uses those. And so one of the things that I think will be really important at the end of this is to hear from you. So think about these questions as you listen today, what NASM recommendations most resonate with you? There will be some that will be particular for organ donation, some for transplantation. So let's hear from you later about what really resonates with you and how you can take action. So in the spirit of our collaborative work in the past, what immediate action might you take next Tuesday or by next Tuesday to call attention to others? And with that, I will turn it over to our panel. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for uh, moderating this session. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon with my colleague, Dennis Wagner, to highlight some of the uh, findings and the recommendations that came from uh, this recent report from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine entitled Realizing the Promise of Equity in the Organ Transplantation System. What I, next slide please, what I would like to do in the time uh, that we have is, is three things uh, primarily. I want to highlight some of the characteristics of the uh, organ transplant system. I want to present uh, some details about the NASM study, how it was done and how we uh, came to our conclusions and recommendations. And then I want to touch on uh, some of the key conclusions and recommendations, understanding that there is way more uh, in this 350 page uh, report than we can talk about in the uh, time that, that we have uh, today. So if I could have the next slide. And this is perhaps a little bit like the proverbial uh, taking uh, coals to uh, Newcastle. Um, but let me just uh, highlight a, a few points about the, uh, the US organ transplant system. Uh, as you all know, and, and many of you are, are much more familiar with these details uh, than I am, but it is a, a highly complex, continually evolving system that has numerous uh, moving parts, more than 250 transplant centers, the 57 organ procurement organizations, more than 5,000 donor hospitals, lots of government agencies, both the regulators and entities like Department of Motor Vehicles and others uh, that help uh, 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 garner donors, uh, thousands, many thousands of, of healthcare professionals, advocacy organizations, and then of course, the patients and, and potential donors. Uh, lots, lots of moving parts, as I said. Since 1954, when the, the first successful uh, kidney transplant was performed, uh, more than a million kidney transplants have been uh, performed in the United States. And uh, transplantation really has become a um, mainstay uh, form of treatment for many kinds of, of organ uh, failure. Uh, last year, 2021, uh, we saw a record number of transplants uh, in the United States with over 41,000 uh, being uh, performed. Uh, unfortunately, as, as we will come back to later, it was also a record year for the number of uh, donated organs that were not used. Um, so uh, despite the, the successes uh, of the system, uh, there are many opportunities uh, for improvement, uh, particularly uh, for the more than 100,000 people who were on the uh, waiting list uh, hoping to, to get a transplant. Perhaps the last point I would note in this regard is, is simply that, um, organ donation is one of the few things uh, in America today uh, that there is almost universal support for. Uh, more than 90% of Americans uh, support organ uh, donation, which uh, really 
uh, speaks to how important it is. Next slide. So I, I want to just uh, further uh, this conversation uh, about the overview, making a few points. And, and I should note that uh, I've asked Dennis to, to jump in uh, whenever he feels uh, he would like to. And uh, there's also certain things that, that he's going to specifically comment on. But I, we thought it would be useful to just highlight some of what the common perceptions are about the uh, organ transplantation in the US and, and what the reality is. For example, uh, it's commonly perceived that people who died while waiting for an organ were just too far down the list to get any offers. But the reality is, is not quite that. It's actually people who die uh, typically have gotten many offers. Um, and, and of course, this doesn't speak to the, the many, many patients who never even make it to the, the waiting list. And we'll talk more about that uh, as, we, as we go along. Uh, it's commonly perceived that donated organs are scarce and they get snapped up very uh, quickly when uh, on the match runs. But that again, is not the reality that organs are, are typically offered many times uh, before they are uh, accepted and, and transplanted uh, if they aren't. Uh, it's commonly perceived that it's the scarcity of organs that's a, the principal limiting factor in, in getting a transplant. And while we know there are not enough uh, donated organs to meet the, the need, uh, as, again, as we will talk more about as we go forward, uh, many organs that are donated uh, aren't used, uh, and they could be used. Uh, it's, it's not that uh, they weren't usable organs to begin with. There's lots of variation uh, in the uh, transplant system. We'll talk a, a lot about that. Um, and uh, well, let me just stop there. Dennis, you wanna comment on other points that, that are made here? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. And I, I do just wanna um, very quickly say thank you to the Alliance, to AST and to NATCO for hosting this. It is truly a pleasure to reconnect with this community of practice on, on this particular report and to be able to join with Dr. Kaiser, who I just respect and admire so much as, as the chairman of the committee. Uh, three quick points about the, the slide that we have up here. You know, I have had um, five years of very intensive work with the organ donation and transplant community when I was at HRSA um, on, on the uh, leading the organ donation breakthrough collaboratives. And then also at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where I spent the last 10 years implementing the Affordable Care Act, when I was very heavily involved in getting the funding and the approval for what has now become the TAKEWELL initiative, uh, sponsored by HRSA in collaboration with, with uh, they're sponsored by CMS in collaboration with HRSA. But I will say that despite all the experience that I uh, had with this community of practice, it was surprising to me some of the things that, that our committee that I learned and other members of our committee learned that are detailed on this slide. You know, I, I always thought that the kidneys that um, are not used were marginal, but when you look closely at the data, there are many kidneys that are, are not marginal that are not used. Um, and I, I think that the, the points that are outlined on this slide are should be of concern to the community of practice. If we don't correct these um, gaps between what the public believes and what the reality is, I think we are in danger of losing some of that trust that, that Dr. Kaiser talked about at the, at the very top of the presentation. The fact that 90% of Americans um, um, support organ donation and transplant is extraordinary, especially in today's polarized times. And I think that taking the actions in this report and closing the gaps that are highlighted on this slide are, are, are really, really important things to do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Sure, Dennis, and, and please jump in when, whenever the, the, the mood strikes you. Um, so oh, yeah. let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, and uh, I want to quickly uh, move through uh, some details uh, about how the, the study was done and, and how it came about. Next slide. So the uh, report that we're talking about today was publicly released at the end of, of February. Uh, there is a pre-publication uh, print that's available from the, the National Academies. The final uh, pretty uh, uh, print version will be available uh, very soon. Uh, so um, you know, feel free to reach out to the Academies for that when, when it's done. Uh, this study was directed to be done uh, by the Congress, uh, and they directed that the National Institutes of, of Health, and specifically the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, fund it and, and be the sponsor of the study. 
we were asked only to focus on uh, deceased organ donation, uh, not a living donation, nor uh, were we asked to look at anything related to uh, tissue uh, or tissue transplants. And while the report uh, considers uh, all types of organ transplantation, it does have a particular focus on kidneys, as, as you might expect since 85% or so of the, the waiting list uh, is for a kidney transplant. Uh, we analyzed the evidence from a, a systems perspective and really were guided by the principle of putting the patient at the, the center of the universe uh, as far as system uh, improvement. And I would be remiss if I, I didn't uh, also note that the, the transplant system does a lot of, of great things and saves a lot of lives every year. Uh, this report, uh, you know, by design, uh, was focused on problems and where we can make improvements to the system. And I would not want one to go away from this thinking uh, that we, we don't think that, or that we thought that the, the system is a failure or anything of that note. It, it, as I said, does lots of good things, uh, but it can do a lot more. Uh, and there's a lot more lives that it could save, a lot more people that it could benefit. Uh, so we really focus on how uh, we could make the system better. Next slide. I was uh, fortunate to uh, chair a, a very diverse and an extremely knowledgeable and talented uh, group of people from across the, the country and, and lots of different institutions and organizations. Here's the, the list of them. Uh, if you have a copy of the report, you can see their full bios uh, in the report. Next slide. Uh, and again, we had a, a long uh, statement of tasks that uh, included a lot of uh, specific things. Uh, I've just kind of as a summary of it, we were asked to look at the economic, ethical, policy, regulatory, and, and operational issues that were relevant to organ allocation uh, policy uh, and decisions uh, that it makes involving uh, deceased donor organizations focusing particularly on how to uh, maximize both uh, public trust as well as professional trust uh, and better align the component parts of the system uh, to achieve uh, the desired uh, outcomes. And again, if you have the report, you can read in more detail all the specific things that we were asked to look at. Next slide. So as is typical of National Academy uh, studies uh, and reports, uh, it was very data-driven. We did a, a very uh, extensive review of the scientific literature, the, the gray literature, and, and anything else that was published that we could get our hands on. Uh, we can commission particular uh, papers on, on top of it uh, to the uh, committee's deliberations. Uh, those can be obtained if, if one wants from the uh, academy. Uh, we, we gathered uh, public input. Uh, we had four uh, public meetings uh, over several months. Uh, we reviewed lots of written comments from stakeholders. And then we uh, reviewed and deliberated on the evidence in lots of meetings, both uh, well, we had 17 uh, full committee meetings and then uh, I don't know, a much larger number of, of smaller subgroup meetings uh, and calls to discuss uh, specific things. I, I would say that this was the first study uh, that I've chaired that was done entirely uh, virtually uh, because of the, uh, the pandemic, All everything was done uh, virtually. Next slide. So with that as uh, some context and background for how the, uh, the study was done and why it was done and what we were asked to do, I want to focus uh, now on what some of the uh, key conclusions and recommendations were uh, that are in the report. I would preface uh, this by noting that I, I do not intend uh, to discuss everything uh, in the report, as I've already said, nor uh, everything that is on the slides. Uh, we understand the slides uh, will be made available and, and uh, may be used later. So I, we wanted to put a lot of uh, information on the slides that people can refer back to. Uh, and uh, there's just too much here to, to uh, go over in the, the time that we have allotted. So next slide, uh, we can 
think about our conclusions and recommendations as really falling into three uh, groupings or three categories. Uh, the first had to do with the need to improve equity uh, in the organ transplant system. The second had to do with uh, the need to use more uh, donated organs. And the third had to do with the need to improve the system and overall uh, system uh, performance. There were multiple uh, conclusions and recommendations that uh, fell into each of those three groupings. If I could have the next slide. So I think one of the overarching uh, uh, conclusions from the study uh, is that notwithstanding uh, the good things that the system does, the uh, current organ transplantation system in the United States is demonstrably uh, inequitable. And that certain uh, types of patients, certain groups of patients, uh, whether they be persons of color or in the lower uh, socioeconomic status, females, olders, individuals with disabilities or various inheritable conditions, others uh, receive organ transplants at disproportionately lower rates uh, than others and at after uh, longer uh, times uh, than other patients with comparable uh, medical need. Uh, next slide. One of the uh, other, I think, important uh, or more uh, important uh, conclusions and observations from the study is that the oversight of the organ transplantation system uh, doesn't begin until individuals are put on the uh, wait list and not uh, when they are diagnosed with end stage uh, organ failure, uh, which is something that we think needs to be uh, corrected. Uh, and we'll come back to uh, recommendation in that regard specifically uh, in a moment. Uh, lots of, of uh, details are provided in the report about uh, the demonstrable inequities uh, in the system. And I think in the interest of time, I will uh, move on uh, to the next slide. So one of the uh, recommendations I wanna highlight here uh, is um, that we believe that the uh, Department of Health and Human Services should be held accountable uh, by the Congress and the public uh, for achieving equity uh, in the organ transplantation system uh, within the next five years. Uh, we talked a lot about what the, uh, the timeline uh, should be. And I think in the, based on our um, considered deliberations feel that time that five years, uh, while it may be uh, somewhat aggressive, it is a reasonable time period to expect that the system uh, should be able to uh, achieve uh, demonstrable equity uh, in the system, as opposed to the uh, inequities that, that currently exist that should begin with uh, HHS publishing uh, or putting forth a, a strategy and, and a plan uh, for doing that, uh, putting its regulatory oversight uh, methods in place, uh, other things. Dennis, do you want to weigh in on this as well? Or? Yeah, I think the one thing I would just say about this is that um, I've been very pleased with the reaction and the response that we've gotten from the federal government to the report. Uh, I think there's been deep and genuine interest in each of the recommendations, um, as you would expect, especially from HRSA and from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, we've had multiple meetings um, um, with uh, key leaders, very senior leaders um, 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 from both of these organizations. So I, I think there is a tremendous amount of interest in the report and they're looking at it very carefully from lots of different perspectives. So I, I'm hopeful that, that, that those things in the report that, are, are, that require action by the federal government will, will receive action by the federal government. There are a lot of things in the report that, that rely on us, all of us who are on this call today to take action. Um, but for those that are specific to the federal government, like you see on this slide, uh, you know, I, I, I would just say that I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with the level of interest that we've seen so far and hopeful. Right, and while it's, it's certainly uh, encouraging uh, over the past two months, uh, we need to, uh, hold them accountable for getting us to where we, we need to go. Next slide. Uh, we had some other specific recommendations about things that could be done to improve equity uh, in the uh, relatively 
short term, uh, OPTN should uh, accelerate finalizing the continuous distribution allocation, allocation uh, framework that's uh, currently underway. Um, we think it uh, should be speeded up uh, to uh, finalize that. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, the committee uh, felt that the OBTN should eliminate pre-dialysis waiting time credit uh, from the, the kidney allocation system, uh, understanding that uh, the uh, you know that this is something that is uh, currently in place, and that we'll have to do some things to make sure that that folks who are currently there uh, don't end up. Uh, being penalized uh, for it, but then uh, this should be uh, eliminated. Next. There were a number of uh, specific uh, recommendations regarding uh, the different organ allocation uh, algorithms. Uh, in the interest of, of time, I'm not going to go through uh, each of these. Uh, there are different technical points. The the one I would call out, though, uh, and that we are uh, hopeful will be acted on uh, in essentially immediately, has to do with changing uh, how kidney function is assessed and, and uh, eliminating uh, the racial component to calculating uh, the ES EGFR uh, rate. Uh, there are some other things that can be done to uh, uh, that need to be done in that regard, uh, but that this is something that there just simply uh, is not a, a biological basis to uh, continue uh, making that uh, differentiation uh, going forward. Next slide. Let me uh, shift gears. Uh, we highlighted a few things in, in the previous slides about uh, improving equity. I wanted to talk about the, the second uh, grouping of findings and recommendations, which had to do with uh, the need to use more organs that are uh, donated. I mean, quite simply, there are too many donated organs that aren't transplanted each year. As I alluded to uh, in some of my first comments, uh, while last year was a record number of transplants in the US, it was also a record number of the number uh, for the number of organs that were not used uh, essentially 25% of donated kidneys uh, were not used. Uh, and that uh, I think in the committee's considered judgment is, is just not uh, acceptable. Uh, it's too easy uh, for transplant centers to uh, decline uh, usable organs and there isn't sufficient accountability built into the system at present to, um, uh, for that. Uh, there, we made observations about the higher uh, non-use of organ rate on, on weekends, and we'll come back and talk more about that, and, and that uh, is a topic of which I, I know Dennis feels uh, very passionate uh, about, and uh, it's something that's not unique to the organ transplant system, but we'll come back to that uh, in a moment. Uh, next slide. The, uh, uh, I, I include this graph uh, in particular because it, it isn't that 2021 was just an outlier year. Uh, the organ non-use rate has been steadily increasing over the last uh, 20 years, uh, despite the, the quality of the organs remaining essentially uh, the same. Uh, as you can see from this, uh, if we go back to uh, the late uh, 1990s, uh, actually late 1980s, uh, that it has just steadily increased. I, we don't have on this slide, which comes directly from the report, uh, the 2021 numbers, uh, which would show that more than 6,400 uh, kidneys, uh, donated kidneys were not used uh, in 2021. Uh, I think that's 24.5%. So essentially a quarter of all of the uh, donated kidneys were not used last year. Next slide. Uh, and here, uh, and I'll ask Dennis to weigh on this. I mean, he, he commented on it earlier, but I mean, the, the perception that the organs aren't used uh, because they aren't uh, good uh, organs uh, is just simply not borne out by the facts. There, there are uh, many uh, very usable, uh, good quality organs uh, that simply uh, are not used. Dennis, you want to? Yeah, yeah, I would just say that. Um... 
Um, like the prior diagram, uh, this diagram is also included in the actual uh, report and there is text that accompanies it as well. This is from peer reviewed published literature uh, by Sumit Mohan, who I'm, I'm sure many of the folks on this call know. And it, it just shows the percentage of kidneys that are transplanted uh, in the black and white bars um, by their KDRI score. Uh, and then it contrasts that with the percentages of kidneys that are discarded um, by their KDRI score. And I would expect to see overlap on the far right hand side, but I was quite astonished to see the level of overlap um, all the way down the curve. Um, and I, I think what, what this is telling us very plainly is that there are many kidneys that we're discarding that we, we should be transplanting. Um, that's, that's really kind of the, the bottom line. And this is a, a summary of 15 years of, of data. Um, so it's, it's a significant number of, of, of kidneys that are being analyzed here on this chart. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Yeah, uh, next slide. And uh, again, as, as we uh, have mentioned al already, that there's, uh, there isn't very good transparency and, and accountability uh, built into the system at present with regard to organ uh, uh, declines and engaging uh, patients in those uh, decisions. And one of our specific recommendations uh, is uh, that we need to increase the, the uh, transparency and accountability that's built into the system. And just to, to help underscore that, that point, uh, we look uh, on, the, on that uh, colorful, but uh, perhaps uh, difficult to interpret uh, graph uh, or figure uh, to the right of the, the text on, on this slide. And what you see is the, the range uh, of uh, offer acceptance uh, within the same uh, donor service areas, uh, which, you know, it's, it's quite uh, variable, uh, and the reasons for that uh, simply aren't uh, explainable. Dennis, again, you wanna... Yeah, if I could, I'll just very briefly say that this diagram also um, is in the report, um, comes again from peer-reviewed published literature. There's text that accompanies it and provides further explanation. I see a number of very technical questions have come into the chat about some of these charts. And I think that the, the best way of handling those would be to actually read the report where, where, where much of that information will be contained. Um, just to quickly explain here, this is the, the uh, probability of, of a dis, uh, deceased donor transplant within three years for patients. And each line on this chart represents a donation service area or uh, an OPO's uh, donation service area. And each diamond on the chart um, reflects the probability of transplant within three years for patients who are listed at that at that transplant center. So the diamonds are transplant centers. Uh, they're arrayed on uh, along a line with their donation service area. And what this shows you, you know, I would say first is that there is variation in OPO performance, um, and we need to do better. We need to close the gap on that variation. Um, it also shows, though, that there's tremendous variation in transplant center performance within the same DSA. Um, um, the, the probability of, of patients listed at one center compared to another within the same DSA, as you can see in, in many cases, is, is quite extraordinary. And that's not good. We, ne we need to close the gap on this variation by replicating the best practices of the highest performers, which is another one of the recommendations that we'll come to uh, as we get further along here. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, yeah, and I think we all recognize that there, you know, in, in a system as large and, and far flung as this, and, and with a country as large as the U.S., there's always going to be some variation. But it's just the the extent of the variation and the fact that it's not explainable uh, that is particularly troubling. Uh, next slide. We spent a, uh, a fair amount of time uh, during the deliberations uh, on uh, how reimbursement policies, payment policies may affect some of these things. Uh, and we do have, uh, and I will refer you to the report for the text and the discussion on this, but you know, the, the fundamental recommendation is uh, that there is a need to align reimbursement uh, with the uh, desired uh, behaviors and outcomes that we would like to see. Uh, again, I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail here uh, about that. Uh, we had, matter of fact, Dennis and I were just earlier this week, I was talking with uh, CMS about that. So 
there, there's interest in, in uh, from the government in, in trying to figure out how to do uh, some of this in, in a way that uh, makes sense. Uh, and I, I think with that, I'll, I'll refer you to the, uh, to the report for further discussion of this and we'll move on to the, uh, the next slide. Uh, again, uh, a recommendation uh, having to do uh, with uh, making it easier uh, for the transplant centers uh, to get to yes uh, when with regard to uh, organ uh, offers had a number of very specific things that uh, were suggested or, or recommended in that regard. Uh, Dennis, I know, do you want to highlight any of, of this or? I think um, um... One of the missing pieces in the current system is there really is no accountability in the system for declining organs. Um, and um, this, what, what the committee sought to do though, was to sort of from a positive perspective, say, what is it that we can do to make it easier to say yes um, uh, for the transplant centers when these organs are offered. And you see here that, that there isn't one solution to that problem. There are many solutions to that problem. And I think that's the good news here, that, that there are opportunities to do things that, that would increase um, the, 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 the use of, of kidneys that are difficult to place, um, to ramp up the number of simultaneous offers that are given at any particular point in time, to increase the use of filters. I think all of the things that you see here are, are viable uh, approaches to getting to yes. Um, and there are many things that are not even included in the report that, 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 that could be added to this list. Um, for instance, some OPOs circle back um, on all of the offers uh, that were accepted outside their DSA to report to the, the, the um, uh, transplant centers that had initially declined organs that were offered to them because they were closer. Um, they hardwire that system. Um, so there, there are many solutions to this problem and what we need to do is implement them. And I think this is one of those areas where people on this call can begin to take many of the kinds of actions that, that would result in, in, in making it easier to say yes. I would just note that uh, the uh, the slide doesn't reflect everything that's said in the report uh, in, in this regard. As Jenna said, there's there's lots of, of potential uh, solutions here or things that would contribute to improvement. Uh, and uh, a lot of that or more detail of that uh, is uh, spelled out in, in the report. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and I want to move to this third uh, bucket uh, or the third grouping of, of conclusions and recommendations having to do uh, with improving uh, overall system performance. And I think the most um, uh, stunning, if, if you will, uh, finding uh, or, or conclusion of the, the committee in, in looking at this in detail was just how variable uh, performance is uh, across the system and uh, that uh, extreme degree of variability is not uh, explainable. Uh, and uh, there were uh, a number of, of solutions that we'll, we'll talk about or, or uh, actions that could be taken to uh, improve this. Uh, well, let me just uh, digress here. Dennis, did you wanna add to this before we move into those? Okay, Let, let's just go ahead into uh, some of the, uh, well, uh, what next slide, uh, just a little bit more as far as the uh, uh, conclusions or observations of, of the uh, committee that I think are relevant to some of the conclusions that we will get to. And, and again, the, uh, to exemplify uh, the degree of variability that exists, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the rate, uh, the three-year uh, rate with which uh, an acceptance for an offer uh, ranges from 4% to uh, 65%, um, which is, is just uh, an extraordinary uh, range of, of variation uh, that, again, is not uh, explainable. Uh, we looked at and, and made the observation, as alluded to already, that the non-use of organs is higher uh, on, on the weekends. Uh, which uh, this is uh, organ transplantation is not the only uh, area of medicine where we've found similar uh, observations. And again, this is uh, an example 
where there is a body of science uh, about what you can do uh, to improve this or to, to fix this problem. Uh, and we'll come back to that uh, again in a moment. Uh, donor care units uh, uh, are, seem to be working and improving uh, outcomes. And I think overall, what uh, what we were impressed with is, you know, how hard uh, people are working, how dedicated uh, the uh, transplant professionals are, but the, the system isn't just uh, optimally designed to achieve uh, the outcomes uh, that it could achieve uh, and that we um, really would expect it to be uh, achieving. Uh, next slide. I would just say too, I would just add, Ken, that the first three items on that chart, these are problems with solutions, right? The fact that we have uh, transplant centers where the probability of, of patients getting transplanted within three years is at 65% is an indication that they have practices and knowledge about how you do that. Um, and, and, and that's true with the use of donor care units and, and many of these other things. So these are problems with solutions and they just require our commitment and our concerted actions to, to bring those solutions to life. And I know this is a community of practice that can do that. Great, thank you, great point. Um, so uh, the committee recommended indeed, uh, the uh, first recommendation uh, is that the uh, Department of Health and Human Services should develop national performance goals uh, for the system overall, uh, and looking particularly at the uh, high performers, uh, those who are achieving the, the top five, uh, 10% uh, of results, uh, and use those findings, which demonstrate they, they can be achieved, um, uh, as the, the basis for uh, setting national goals, uh, whether that be an improving uh, donation among uh, underserved populations or uh, reducing uh, the non-use rates or increasing the number of um, donations from the DCDD uh, donors. Uh, and uh, we also felt that uh, it would be very uh, reasonable to uh, expect that the uh, number of transplants in this country could get to uh, 50,000 or more uh, over the next five years, uh, i.e. by 2026. And I, I would just say on this one, Ken, really quickly, you know, Jan had asked that question at the very top of the hour about which recommendations resonate with you the most. And this is definitely one of my top two uh, in terms of resonating in terms of how I feel. I know that when we set national goals, like we did previously in this work uh, when uh, with the Organ Donation Breakthrough Collaborative, Secretary Thompson set a goal of uh, that 75% uh, conversion rates in the nation's uh, largest trauma centers. And we, we knocked the ball out of the park with that. And I'm confident that we can do that again here. Uh, I also just wanna note that there are folks in the chat that are piling onto that. <laughs> so uh, it's very encouraging to see that. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, uh, and uh, just uh, focusing on that, that third uh, bullet down there, uh, about DCDD donors uh, and increasing that to at least 45% of all of the uh, deceased or organ donors and, and not at the uh, expense of uh, the uh, neurologically uh, determined uh, death. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, again, a, a figure, um, uh, next slide, uh, from the uh, report, if we go to the next slide, please. Oh, before that, yeah, uh, just to underscore again, the, uh, the variability uh, in the, the system, and, and this looks at the, the 57 uh, OPOs and, and their uh, variability in the percent of donation after determination of circulatory death donors. Uh, and as you can see, it, it goes from a, around 11 or 12% uh, to about 53, 54%. Uh, um, so it's just uh, inexplicable uh, variation that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, next slide. While there are uh, a fair number of uh, metrics that are used in the, uh, the, the uh, organ transplant system uh, at present, uh, it was the committee's uh, conclusion, if you will, that 
they may or may not be the right ones uh, and that there was need for additional ones. Uh, and we have a specific recommendation regarding the need to create a dashboard of uh, standardized metrics to uh, track uh, performance across the, the system uh, and um, provide some examples uh, of what some of these uh, new or uh, additional uh, measures might be in this figure that comes from the uh, from the report. Uh, I'll be, although uh, recognizing that this is was not intended to be uh, a an exhaustive list of what those measures uh, might be. Uh, Dennis, let me ask you to comment here if you. Yeah, I would I would say that in the case of of transplant centers. Um, uh, a fair number of the measures that we're suggesting here already exist. In the case of OPOs, um, I think it would be correct to say that practically every OPO measures the things that you see on, the, on this list, but the issue is they're not standardized and we need to have standardized measures in order to guide improvement and to guide regulatory action as well. Um, so I think the committee felt very strongly that we need standardization, that these are the the principal things that we need to count and measure at a minimum that should be standardized. And beyond that, the committee also felt like there's an opportunity here to work with organizations who are expert at this work, like the National Quality Forum, uh, to establish standardized measures that make the most sense for both um, donor hospitals, OPOs, and transplant centers. And that's that's at the heart of the recommendation here, is that standardization and the work with uh, professional organizations that are particularly skilled at helping um, communities of practice like like these communities of practice to do so. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Yeah, no, I, and I, I would just underscore uh, that point. Um, you know, certainly the, in other areas of medicine, and, and I, I reflect back on the years that, that um, I was at the NQF and, and starting it, I mean, a, a big part of the reason for creating the National Quality Forum was to, to get that standardization, uh, because if the measures aren't the same. I mean, it, it's the old apples to apples comparisons that, that if they're not the same, you, you really uh, can't use the measures the way that you would like to, to uh, assess performance and, and help you uh, improve uh, overall performance. And we can come back and talk about that more later. Uh, next slide. So again, a, uh, the report makes a specific recommendation about uh, establishing uh, a donor care unit uh, for in each uh, OPO. Uh, the uh, 11 uh, OPOs that currently have them, I think, are uh, showing that, that they are a uh, successful innovation. Uh, and the committee felt this should um, be expanded and that each OPO should develop uh, or create and establish a, a, a donor care unit. Next slide. Uh, and again, a, uh, a recommendation that certainly is uh, near and dear to uh, both uh, my heart and, and Dennis's uh, about the need to embed uh, continuous quality improvement uh, into uh, the fabric of, of the organ transplantation system. Indeed, it, it has to become a standard way of, of doing business, that it's, everything is about quality improvement. So Dennis, why, why don't you uh, expand on this? Well, I, I think that maybe I'll just quickly say that that, that Jan, uh, this is another one that really resonates with me, no surprise, and, and with Dr. Kaiser, as you just heard. Um, I think a, an additional point that I would make here is that this is a community of practice that knows how to do this, right? Like we just need to resource it. We need to focus on linking our, our quality improvement to things like national goals that are measurable and time limited, um, and then sustain that work over time. And I think this is a, an area where organizations like the Alliance, like AST, like NATCO, all have very, very important roles to play. Um, this is work that you do together. It's not something that the government assigns. You know, this is something that is a community of practice we work on together and we embrace, ideally uh, with good, you know, solid government involvement and support for the work as well. Back to you, Dr. Kaiser. Yeah, uh, next slide. And I'm mindful of the clock here. So I'm just gonna touch on two more uh, recommend and, and do so uh, briefly, and then we'll try to, to wrap this up. I, uh, a lot of discussion uh, during the committee's deliberations about the policymaking uh, process OPTN uses and um, 
while it's uh, inclusive, uh, it's also uh, cumbersome and slow. Uh, and there were a number of things that could be done to improve that process. Uh, again, uh, this isn't uh, a unique situation. Uh, there are other entities which have been dealing with very complicated and, and difficult uh, technical uh, public policy issues uh, like the National Quality Forum, uh, National Academy of Public Administrations and others. Uh, and we uh, felt that the OPTN should avail itself of the expertise and the experience that exists in some of these bodies uh, to try to uh, improve its policymaking uh, process. And have a number of uh, specific things that are detailed in the report in this regard. Uh, next slide. And then the, the last uh, recommendation I, I would highlight here uh, before we wrap it up is, is uh, again, a lot of discussion about the IT infrastructure uh, that uh, underlays uh, the, the system. Uh, and uh, we felt there's a, a need to uh, relook at this. Uh, and uh, we didn't make a recommendation specifically about how uh, it um, it might be uh, resolved, but did offer some, some options for how it might be approached, but felt that HHS uh, really uh, should ensure that the OBTN is, is using state-of-the-art uh, IT infrastructure and, and really uh, takes advantage and optimizes the use of some of the new and, and evolving technologies uh, that may be particularly uh, relevant to something like organ transplantation. So with that, let me um, just try to sum up this with the next slide. So if we were to try to distill down uh, all of the, uh, the recommendations uh, that are in this report, uh, we might come to something that, that looked like this as, as far as improving the system performance, that we would go from having an inequitable system uh, to within five years, having a system that's uh, demonstrably uh, equitable. Uh, instead of patients being unaware of their organ declines, that uh, they would be aware and that there would be routine processes for uh, informing them uh, about uh, the decisions that are made on their behalf, particularly things like shared decision-making that we would move from uh, now 25% of uh, deceased donor kidneys not being used to less than 5% uh, of uh, donor kidneys not being used. That is a very uh, substantive, but we believe uh, achievable uh, drop in the non-use of donated uh, kidneys. We would move from the uh, inexplicable wide variation that, that currently exists uh, across the OPOs, the transplant centers, the donor hospitals, to uh, much uh, less variation, and where there is variation, that that uh, variation would be explainable, uh, and we would understand why uh, it did exist. We would move from having a, a limited number of um, uh, performance measures to really a, a robust uh, dashboard of consensus metrics that provided a more complete picture of how the system uh, was performing. We would go from having a few uh, OPOs having donor care units to all of them having them. And we would move from a legacy uh, IT system to really a forward-looking state-of-the-art IT system uh, that takes advantage of all of the uh, really amazing technological developments that are occurring uh, almost on a daily basis. So with that, um, we're going to shift in the last couple of minutes here from what's in the report uh, per se uh, to some thoughts about um, what we can do going forward. Um, and uh, you know, really thinking about what are those things that, that we could be doing essentially uh, immediately? And I'm going to ask Dennis, uh, if you would, uh, to kind of walk through uh, some of these. Uh, we have, have offered here a, a list of 11 uh, things that we think uh, action could be taken today uh, or starting today uh, that would uh, operationalize the, uh, the recommendations in the report, uh, as well as uh, make material 
uh, improvement in the, the system overall. So uh, Dennis, I don't know if you want to, I'm, I'm happy to walk through these or if you want to, uh, to uh, run with them, why don't, why don't you take it and okay. people are probably yep. tired of listening to me. I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly step to the next three slides. So. Um, I know that this is a group that's all about action. I've worked with donor hospitals, transplant centers, and OPOs in the past, and I, I know that you're, you are, are, are self-motivated, uh, high-achieving people who, who really seek to make things better for the patients that we serve and the institutions that serve them. Uh, so these slides are all about the actions that, that individuals on this call could take, uh, actions that you could take starting next Tuesday. Um, um, in terms of, of the actual things that you can do. So these are, are things that, that aren't just specific to CMS should do this and HHS should do that and the OPTN should do this. These are things that we can do. Um, I'll just uh, focus on number four as an example. Identify the key offer acceptance practices of the highest performing transplant centers and develop action plans to adapt and adopt those practices. Um, this data is available on the SRTR. You can look at the on the SRTR and identify the transplant centers that are leading the way on this, um, and then to connect with them around their own best practices. Uh, this, this is work that can be, be done immediately. If I could have the next slide, I'm not going to read through each of the bullets here because I, I know we're close to the, the amount of, of time that we have available. Um, um, agree on the need to manage hospital surgical flow. Um, so this is something that's bigger than transplant centers. This cuts across the entire hospital. Improving flow, um, that is to say, smoothing out elective surgeries so that they occur Monday through Saturday, six days of the week, instead of Monday through Thursday, as, as is often the case in many hospitals. Smoothing out elective surgeries across the six days of the week um, helps to ensure that there is um, urgent and emergent care available both to um, for, for donors and for transplant recipients. Uh, there are known best practices. There are hospitals like um, Cincinnati Children's or UHN in Toronto or Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville that have done a lot of work on this already. Um, and these are things that hospitals could begin to, to take up and to, to implement immediately. Um, you know, I'm, a, uh, I, I'm trained as a senior uh, executive in the US Civil Service. And the training that I got um, for, for the work that I've performed in the federal government is, is some of the best training in, in leadership and management that you can possibly get. And one of the things that I learned is that amateurs talk strategy and professionals talk logistics and action. And these slides are all about logistics and action. And they're the kinds of things that we can do um, if we're in a donor hospital, if we're in an OPO or if we're in a transplant center. If I could have the next slide, which has the last two items on it, um, um, develop and implement strat. So this, this item number nine would be directed to people in transplant centers, develop and implement strategies to increase transparency and accountability for organ offer declines, including routine consultation with patients on the organ offers that were declined on their behalf. Um, it's common practice to have fairly extensive conversations with patients when they're first listed for transplant, but it's not common practice to regularly communicate back every three or four months to patients about organ offers that were declined on their behalf. Um, we need to ramp up the transparency in this area and the needs of patients change over time. Um, uh, we know that um, and, and, and it's absolutely imperative that we begin to develop the strategies and methods that are necessary to do this kind of consultation and work with patients, um, just as one example. Um, this item number 11 is speaks to the quality improvement. Assess your own organization's performance compared to the best in class performers, um, your peers. And that data is readily available to all of us. Um, and then set the goals for your organization. Don't wait for the federal government to do it. Like do it, do it, do it now. Um, these are all things that we can do. And these are all things that I know this community of practice knows how to be in action on. I think this is maybe our last slide before turning it over to Jan Fenn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. It is. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. That was really wonderful. I saw lots of great comments in the chat, and I know everyone's excited about this work. So Deanne is going to tell us how to give some feedback, and then I want to talk just about a few things. I know that we're going to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes and hope that everyone will be able to do that because we really do want to hear from you. So Deanna, I'm going to let you um, explain Mentimeter, please. 
Thank you, Jan. So just as a reminder to everyone, we'd really love to hear your feedback on these two questions or just your overall thoughts. So um, to submit any comments that you may have in response to these questions, go ahead and navigate to menti.com. Um, you can open up a separate tab in, in your current browser, or you can feel free to open up a new browser, but you'll go ahead and type in menti.com, and then you'll be prompted to enter a code. When you are prompted, you're going to go ahead and enter the code 38058229. Some of our tech savvy listeners, you're welcome to also scan the QR code here on the screen um, using the camera on your phone, and that should also open you up to Mentimeter. Um, if, if Mentimeter does not work with will work for you, you're welcome to either reach out to us through the Zoom chat, or you can simply just submit your comments through the chat feature itself. And so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back to Jan. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Deanna. So as we're thinking about this, the NASM recommendations, I know many people are, are really eager to talk about how they can get more information. What kind of data do you have at your own fingertips? I know for us, we really wanted to get behind the 50,000 goal. So we thought about it in terms of what's our portion? What's realistic? How can we continue to push? And for our organization, we decided we knew that we could grow and we knew what our contributions would be and how much that would increase and talking about how to ramp it up. But you have to have best practices to put those kinds of things into place. So learning from others is really important. And I think that's how we can rely on some of the groups that really were sponsoring this today. The Alliance is often sharing best practices from others, but certainly there are many other ways through NATCO, AOPO, AST, and our uh, professional organizations that are talking about these specific things. So um, I think Kevin just put a, a little comment in there about donor care units and the impact on transplant centers. I will say that uh, donor care units are popping up. And one of the things that I enjoyed hearing from Dennis about was really the whole theory behind that in that it's to help hospital throughput and really thinking how we can increase satisfaction, not only of the caregivers, but just the overall hospital experience freeing up some of the resources in the ICU and the operating rooms so that they can do other types of things. But also on the donor side of it, on the OPO side, we believe that the specialized care that's given in a donor care unit will result in more transplants. We also know we're going to take very good care and have been for over 20 years in other facilities, taking care of those donor families and really maximizing their experience as best we can in that situation. So um, Deanna, have anything, uh, do you have anything to share? Oh, great. This is wonderful. Wow. Looks like a lot of excitement about quality improvement, DCUs, uh, some term ORC, Organ Recovery Center. I like donor care unit, We're getting ready to open ours. Nice. The inequities I know is um, something that has been really important over the last couple of years. And so I know I saw a few comments earlier about that and how to really get to the bottom of it. And I think the thing that I was most appreciative about is really just a realization. Well, how are we doing? And so it goes back to assessing our performance, not just on a data level, but also looking at, are we equitable? Are we providing the right type of environment for families to say yes when we're on the donor side? Are we getting patients listed on the transplant center side? So Deanna, I think it'd be great if we could go to the second question. Someone just popped up and said they want to <laughs> vote on the second action. Um, so what immediate actions might you take by next Tuesday to call attention to the others? And, and really it's calling attention to ourselves too. I think this may be new information for some. The first announcement for the recommendations came out in February the 25th. And that's when we really started looking at it. But I'm really enthused to see the number of people on this call, knowing that we have a whole new audience. And certainly you heard from the experts today. One thing that for myself, I would like to do uh, in, in my work with AOPO and also in just knowing now that we have the expert with Dr. Kaiser with the National Quality Forum and thinking about how we can get some real data definitions that are consensus-based to get those metrics established so that we will move, be able to move forward and get some weight behind that. So people are interested in, in responding and saying, yes, I wanna submit my data because I want to learn from others. 
that will help in, in many other ways when you think about expedited placement of organs. You know, what's the best practice for that? So um, I think for me too, in, in thinking about next Tuesday, it's reaching out to our transplant centers and really talking about acceptance practices. What are the things that are working for them? But then being able to layer on top of that, what are the highest performing transplant centers? The ones that have the best practices, what are they doing? How can we make that comparison and maybe teach others through that? Speaking to our transplant leadership about talking to patients, yes, that's a real challenge. But I do think if you're on the patient side of it, you want to know about the offers that you've been received. So what if you had five offers that you never knew about? And that's a, a real challenge I know for transplant centers, but certainly not impossible. Anything is possible really when, it, when we're looking out for patients. We'll look at centers with best acceptance rates to reach out to them. I like that too. I think that's really important. And Jan, if I could, if I could just jump in real quick, sure. I, I wanted to um, just acknowledge there were a lot of questions about the availability of slides, and Carrie uh, um, Hobson Pape just put in that um, that they will be distributed to all attendees, and that in about an hour, if you click on the link that's now in the chat, you can uh, obtain a copy of the slides as well. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And then one other really quick thing. Um, um, you referenced the fact that donor care units actually are, are um, uh, an important practice that aligns very nicely with the known best practices around improving hospital flow. Uh, Dr. Eugene Litvak uh, with Harvard University uh, is probably the leading national and international expert in operations management in hospitals. And when he was presented with um, information about donor care units, he said, this is exactly what you do with flow. You assign resources that only can be used for urgent uh, care. And you have those resources assigned and only available for that purpose in hospitals. Uh, again, not a common practice across hospitals, but one of the essential ones to properly managing flow. Um, and and donor care units are, are precisely that. Um, so I, I did just want to comment on, on that. And go on, please. I, I, I just oh, want no. to cut in with those, those things very quickly, Jan. Thank you. I think that's really important, Dennis. You know, we talked a lot about the donor care unit um, recommendation. And for our own OPO, myself, uh, we're super excited that the summer ours will be opening. However, um, I think with some of the smaller OPOs, that presents a challenge. But it doesn't say very specifically that you need to build a multi-million dollar building. There are numerous ways to get to this answer. It may be collaborating with a small area in a hospital that's already there. But those resources, as Dennis just said, are set aside for that specific purpose. Or it may be partnering with another OPO that's close to you and build building one where you can jointly share some of those costs and resources. It does need to be managed by the OPO in the OPO's control. And I think there's a lot of opportunity and that really was in the recommendations too, when you dig a little deeper about rehabilitation of organs or pumping or just all of the different techniques and uh, things that we can do to improve the number of organs that are available. I see lots of things coming in that are scrolling by. So this is really exciting to hear from you all. Um, I, I think we should also open it up in the chat to see if anyone has a particular question for Dennis or for Dr. Kai. I know oh, they've I been putting things oh. up. <laughs> Yeah, if I, well, I've seen some things come in that I would just briefly comment on, um, and, and then I'll, I'll stop and so we can check in with Dr. Kaiser. But um, there are comments around a fair number of comments around donor care units like, yes, this is great, we should do more of it, or it's very difficult to do it in a multi state situation, you know, or more difficult to do it, or CMS needs to attend to reimbursement issues related to donor care units. And so I, I just wanted to say a couple things about that. One, this is an area of interest at, at, at CMS, you know, this is one of the areas that they're looking at and they're exploring. So that would be the first thing I would say. Um, this has caught the attention of CMS and they, they you know, want to be smart and careful about um, how they approach it. The second thing I'd say, and this is really repeating something that you already said very correctly, I think, Jan, is there's more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to how you configure a donor care unit. Um, it can be configured within a transplant center, just for instance, in ways that don't uh, significantly impact payment for the transplant center. Um, and there are other ways to configure them as well, um, both in terms of geography, but also in terms of the financial arrangements that are used for that. The report acknowledges this. There's text about this in the report. So I just wanna call that to people's attention because there's a very limited amount of time that we have on this call. But these are issues that the committee very carefully considered in, in making the recommendations that, that were advanced on this. So um, go ahead, Dr. Kaiser. 
Yeah, I, I just want to uh, take a different subject, but uh, build on that theme of there's more than one way to, to do something. And I, I did notice a comment uh, about uh, nursing uh, uh, you know, shortages and not enough staff to deal with the uh, smoothing out the flow. And, and what I would, would say is, yeah, if you do everything the way that you've done it before, that's probably true. Uh, and this really uh, requires going back and looking at, at, at the system and how things are done and reconfiguring and rethinking how uh, the work is done. Uh, and, you know, I'm certainly am mindful of the, uh, particularly with COVID, uh, the, the stress on, on people and, and the, uh, the shortage of staffing, not just nurses, but the shorting, uh, shortage of staff across the board. But th these are problems that have been solved without a big influx of resources elsewhere. But it does require that we relook at and rethink about, reconceptualize how the work is done. Uh, you, you can't uh, get there by just doing things the, the same way you've always done it in the past. So, yeah, that's an excellent point. I think we've learned that and learning just to test something, give it a try. You know, there was a question that came in as people were registering that I thought was really important, and it might be helpful um, as we're thinking about wrapping this this time up that we have together. And it said, "What is the biggest challenge in implementing the recommendations?" So for me, and I, I want to collect answers from uh, each Dennis and Dr. Kaiser. I think the biggest challenge for that is not doing anything, waiting for someone else to take action. And we all know that we are a community of practice that works very well together. And this is a perfect avenue for us to say, let's go down this path and let's try some things and not wait for someone else to fix a concern or just keep doing things the way we've always done them. But uh, Dr. Kaiser, I don't know what you would like to add to that. I, I guess I uh, there are two things that really uh, stand out for me. Um, one is the non-use rate, which I think uh, is just unconscionable uh, at this point. And, and there are uh, multiple things that could be done to address that. Uh, I think that we just have to recognize that, that when 25% of the donated organs aren't used, that is an un just totally unacceptable uh, and something that has to be addressed. The other big point for me is, is the, the inequity of the system uh, and that we really have to do better uh, from an equity point of view. Uh, but that means going upstream uh, and looking at things, not just when people get on the wait list, but when they are approaching that end stage organ failure. Uh, and there's a lot of, of details that have to be worked through to make that happen but it's doable. Uh, and particularly in something like kidneys where there is so much known and where you know, the government has control of, uh, or is because it's a payer, uh, you know, it has so much information uh, in this regard uh, that you know, I, I just don't think that we can continue to accept as a nation um, the, the degree of inequity uh, that currently exists in the system. Uh, we, we have to do better. Very well said. Thank you. Dennis, any other things you want to talk about uh, in terms of challenges? Well, I, I, I think the first thing I would say is I completely agree with the items that Dr. Kaiser just mentioned. Um, and I also agree um, uh, down to the, the, the roots of my soul with what you said, uh, Jan, about um, the greatest danger is inaction you know, we need to begin taking action. And there are many actions that we can take from whatever our platform is, whether it's a donor hospital platform or an OPO platform or a transplant center platform. Um, don't wait for others to take the action. Now, align with the actions that others are taking. You know, if, if, if we see national goals coming out from organizations like AOPO or the federal government on discard rates, align with those, grab them and, and, and use them to get your institution to, to, to take actions uh, based on the, the, the agreement that exists already and the leadership that's already present. You know, I think that's, that's a huge opportunity for us. In terms of sort of gnarly or important challenges that I think really deserve attention, um, um, I, I do think that, that um, greater transparency with waiting patients is, is very important. Um, 
and you know I often hear people say things like well I can't possibly consult with every patient every time I get an organ offer and I appreciate that I think there's truth to that but that doesn't prevent us from going back every three months with those patients and sharing the data on organ offers that were declined on their behalf I think that will I think that transparency is needed because it's the right thing to do for patients that we serve. And I also think that it can help to drive further progress around organ offer acceptance. Um, uh, I had the great pleasure in the last couple of years that I was at CMS of working um, in the area of human-centered design. And we brought in lots of patients who had received transplants and lots of patients who were waiting for transplants and discussed these various issues with them. And most patients were astonished to learn that, that, that there were organ offers that, that they never knew about um, ever. Um, I, I think we, we need to figure out how to crack that, that, you know, that transparency issue. I think that one's a little harder and it's gonna take more effort and more testing, but I think it's totally doable. The, this community of practice is used to solving difficult problems that, that involve interdependence with other people. Um, and I think that's, that's an important one to go after. Both gave us some really great things to think about. Um, I know that we are past our time and I wanna be respectful of that. I really thank you so much for what you brought to this, not just today, but this whole development, because I know it was a very long period of time that both of you worked on this critical issue and with great enthusiasm. So a special thanks to you all. Deanna, I will turn it back over to you for any final thoughts or uh, instruction. Thank you, Jan. I just wanna echo your sentiments, Dr. Kaiser and Dennis, thank you so much for, for taking the time to join us and provide us with that high level overview and some of the uh, recommended immediate actions that the community can take. I think. Based on the comments, you can see that's been very valuable for the community. And so I really appreciate you taking that time. And Jan, certainly want to thank you as well for facilitating today's discussion and providing your own um, insight and input as well. Um, just to, to echo um, and answer some of the questions that were submitted in the chat regarding today's session, we have recorded today's session. And we'll make it available on our website for those of you who may have bounced in and out and may have missed certain se uh, segments. And in that same vein, we'll also make the, the slides available to all of you as well. Um, as Carrie uh, popped in the chat, it will be posted to our community resource toolbox, but it will also be made available via email um, once we've been able to compile you know, the recording and everything. So we'll make sure to get that out to all of you, um, but just wanted to give you that information. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention in the same vein is there will be a post um, event evaluation made available to all of you. So certainly um, we wanna hear from you, you wanna hear your thoughts, any um, requests that you may have as it pertains to the NASM report, any additional information you may be looking for, um, feel free to complete that evaluation to let us know so that we can um, ultimately put together some uh, future programming for you. So with that, I just wanna thank everyone and um, wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.